Now let's turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 39. Chapter 1, verse 39. It's on page 5. Soon afterwards, Mary got ready and hurried off to the hill country to a town in Judea. She went into Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby moved within her. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in a loud voice, You are the most blessed of all women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Why should this great thing happen to me, that my Lord's mother comes to visit me? For as soon as I heard your greeting, the baby within me jumped with gladness. How happy are you to believe that the Lord's message to you will come true. Mary said, My heart praises the Lord. My soul is glad because of God my Savior, because he has remembered me his lowly servant. From now on, all people will call me happy because of the great things the mighty God has done for me. His name is holy. He shows mercy to those who fear him from, generation, from one generation to another. He stretched out his mighty arm and scattered the proud with all their plans. He brought down mighty kings from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He kept the promise he made to our ancestors and came to the help of his servant Israel. He remembered to show mercy to Abraham and to all his descendants forever. Mary stayed about three months with Elizabeth and then went back home. As I told you last Sunday night, the four Gospels by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are portraits rather than photographs, and each of them was enabled to pick out some aspects of the rich character of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that putting all four together, we see a lovely composite picture of what our Lord really was like. And one of the features I mentioned that St. Luke brings out more than any of the other three Gospels is the place of women in the gospel story and the vital part they played in bringing our Lord Jesus Christ to us. For example, in Luke's gospel alone, in chapter 8, it is mentioned that apart from going around with 12 men as disciples, that there were also women who traveled around with him, a fact that's often forgotten and overlooked. But there were a number of women who went around with Jesus. Some of them he'd healed from physical sickness or demonic possession. But it says this, that some of them were wealthy and ministered to Jesus out of their substance. In other words, he had a number of wealthy ladies who were able to provide clothes and food and do the cooking for the disciples. It's one of those insights that you tend to forget. Not that Jesus, I think, would have had much sympathy with women's lib. I think he would feel that that was an attempt to obliterate the differences God has made and to spoil the pattern of life that God intended. And indeed, I think the Lord Jesus would say that women's lid was degrading to the fair sex. But go back to Luke. We see that in this gospel, Jesus used women with their unique gifts to do things that men couldn't do just as he used men with their unique gifts to do things that women couldn't do. And it is this lovely balance of seeing the differences of function, not differences of status, insofar as women's lib is protesting against difference of status. They are biblical. But insofar as they try and ignore the differences that God made when he made us male and female, they are a symptom of our godless age. And so you find that women keep coming into this gospel at critical points where they could do something that men could not do. I think, for example, at the very end of the story, after his death, where the women came to anoint the body. 
And men really are out of place in such a situation. I remember going into one home where the corpse of a loved one was laid out and I stood at the bed and we looked at the remains. And a woman just went in and just put the hair right and just fluffed up the pillow as a man would never have thought of doing on an occasion like that. Just wouldn't somehow be the same. And so the Lord called those women to go and lay Jesus' body out in the tomb and anoint it properly, a job that they could do, and therefore they were the first to know about the resurrection. Not only after his death, but before his birth, women had a vital part to play. Indeed, the Christmas story would just not be possible without women. And I remember the great wit who was approached by a women's liver who said, uh, what do you think, she said to the man, what do you think is the essential difference between men and women? And he said, madam, I cannot conceive, which I thought was a, <laughs> a pretty witty remark. And in fact, that highlights this tremendous truth that in fact, the Lord God needed two women to get the whole gospel going. And without them, it just wouldn't have started. And it's at times like this, during this nine-month period, that we men feel quite helpless and just feel we're out of it, we're on a limb. As on a wedding day, it's the bride's day and the bridegroom's just needed for the ceremony. You, you feel you're out of things. Something is happening that you're just vaguely connected with and um, the woman is doing it all. And so the Lord God chose two women, Elizabeth and Mary, for the beginning of the gospel. One was elderly, one was young and in her mid-teens. And these two, spanning the ages of womanhood, were the ones whom God chose. This morning's Bible study is about these two women. They were related, they were probably first cousins, though we're not sure of the exact relationship. Socially, they were as far removed from each other as they were in age. One was married to a wealthy priest and the other was engaged to a very humble village carpenter. Yet these two, spanning ages, spanning social classes, related physically, were to be related spiritually in a remarkable secret which they shared together for months before anyone else had any wind of that secret. One day, Mary, the younger teenage girl, went on foot over 70 miles to visit her elderly cousin. It would be 70 miles as the crow flies, but no Jew walked in the line of the crow's flight because they crossed the Jordan, went down the other side, came up through Jericho and up to Jerusalem, up through the hills to avoid going through Samaria and meeting any Samaritans. So I'm afraid the journey was even longer than it need have been. And up she came up to Jerusalem and over the top of the hills and westward down the hill to a little village which is still there today called Ein Karem. And here lived Elizabeth, her cousin. Why did she come? Why did a 15-year-old girl make that long journey? A journey she'd make again nine months later. For Bethlehem is just a mile or two from Ein Karem. Why did she go? She went to see just one thing. She went to see if it could possibly be true that her elderly cousin, now in her late 50s or early 60s, was pregnant. That's why she went. And if we can try and get inside that teenage girl's mind, she was thinking over an incredible experience in which an angel told her, you are going to have a baby boy without ever being married, without ever knowing a man. And since the angel disappeared, Mary's mind must have been saying, was that real? How could such a thing possibly happen? But the angel had said something else, and had said, if you want proof of this, your elderly cousin is now six months gone. Go and see her. In other words, if her elderly cousin could be having a baby with a man, then she as a teenager would find it possible to have a baby without a man. And so as she went that long journey and neared the house in Ein Karem, her mind must have been saying, I wonder what I'll find. I just can't imagine Elizabeth looking well about her, which is my father's phrase for a girl expecting a baby. And Mary must have been getting more and more excited, more and more tense as she got near. Went through the little courtyard, knocked at the door, come in, said a voice, and when she went in, she took one look, 
There was Elizabeth, leaning slightly back with swelling tummy, and Mary knew straight away. It's not only possible, it's going to happen. The moment is most dramatic. Just see for yourself this elderly woman, maybe with gray hair, and this 15-year-old girl staring at each other. And suddenly they're in each other's arms and kissing and saying all the things that you do say, nice to see you, how are you, how wonderful. And suddenly, in that moment when they've seen each other, Elizabeth springs back, steps back, looks at Mary, and joins the Pentecostals. That's what happened. I'm using that phrase quite seriously. At that point, she was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with a loud voice. So glad the scripture is accurate enough to include that word loud. One of the things that keeps many people from being filled with the Spirit is that they're scared stiff. They'll develop a loud voice. They think that God only speaks in a still, small voice. Well, he only did once. On the other occasions when God spoke, it was like a clap of thunder. God can be a noisy God. Somehow we've got into this thinking that a thing is more spiritual if it's quiet, if it's terribly still, and if we're terribly whispery, you know? that we should whisper in church. I tell you that when the Holy Spirit really fills people, they get noisy. And they use a loud voice. And people will look around, and maybe what we're really afraid of is not using a loud voice to God, but we're worried about what other people will say. Oh, they've joined the hallelujah crowd, you know? But Elizabeth, thank God, was an elderly lady who let the Spirit fill her and shouted with a loud voice. And it came out like that. And that's likely to happen, and I just wish somebody else would sometimes shout hallelujah as well. And so Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And when we are, this is the usual overflow. When you're full up, that's where it'll come out. And every time you read in the Bible of people being filled with the Holy Spirit, you find that's where it shows. That's where something happens. And this happened to dear Elizabeth. And so she stepped back, and there in that kitchen, her voice rose way above normal level. And out came the most wonderful things, things that she'd never thought she would say, and things that didn't come from her mind, because the things she said were, were just couldn't be further from her thoughts. Do you realize that up till this moment, Elizabeth had no idea whatever what was happening to Mary? She had no idea whatever. As far as Elizabeth was concerned, it was her young cousin come to visit her. And that's all she'd thought when she said, hello, nice to see you. But now... Now, through the Holy Spirit, she sees things she never saw before. She understands things she never understood before. And out it pours. And we're going to look now at the things she says. She was doing what the Bible calls prophesying. Prophesying. But when God gets hold of your tongue, the most amazing utterances become possible for anyone, the most ordinary person. Now, let's see what she said. It's sheer poetry... But I want you to notice it was said, not sung, just as the Magnificat was said, not sung. But because of the poetry, these words have become hymns of praise used by the church for these 2,000 years. But she makes four statements. The first is a statement of congratulation. Now, this is surprising because really you'd have thought when they met that Mary would be congratulating Elizabeth. Oh, Elizabeth, you're going to be a mother after all these years congratulations, but no, it's Elizabeth who congratulates Mary. The Holy Spirit has reversed their roles, and it's Elizabeth who's taking the initiative. And to understand Elizabeth's excitement, you've got to go back to the Old Testament. For centuries, the Old Testament had promised that one day God would send a Messiah, a Savior, a Deliverer, somebody who would fulfill the dreams of his people. And every Jewish girl had one ambition, to be the mother of that Messiah. They knew that one day a Jewish girl would have a baby boy who would be the Savior, the Messiah, the Christ. Messiah is the Hebrew word, Christ is the Greek word. They use both words. And now Elizabeth has been remembering something else the Old Testament says. At the very end of the Old Testament, 400 years previously, the last prophet to appear... God hadn't been speaking for four centuries, but the last thing he'd said was this. Not only would he send the Messiah, but he would send someone just ahead of him as his messenger to prepare his way. 
And now Elizabeth knows that in her womb is that messenger. From one point of view, she may have just had a little twinge of disappointment. I can't have the Messiah now because I'm to be the mother of the messenger. But I guess that the disappointment, if it ever even occurred to her, was swallowed up in the excitement that she was producing the messenger. And she must have wondered with Zechariah, her husband, who will produce the Messiah? Things are moving after 400 years. The messenger's on the way, and therefore somewhere in this land there's a girl going to have a baby who will be the Messiah. And so they must have discussed it over the meals many times. Who do you think it'll be? Where do you think it'll be? And when Mary came in through that courtyard door, Elizabeth knew it was her own young cousin who was going to be the mother of the Messiah. Can you imagine the feeling in her heart? Her heart must have missed a beat. And something else beat inside her when her heart stopped beating. That's how she knew. We'll come to that in a moment. But oh, she says, you, you're going to be the mother. And so she just says, blessed, blessed, blessed. Oh, how happy. Oh, my congratulations. She uses the word makarios. We've come to know that word more recently through the name of the Archbishop of Cyprus, but makarios means blessed, happy, to be congratulated. Oh, how fortunate. Except that fortunate is based on the word fortune and Christians don't believe in luck. Uh, makarios means blessed. Oh, how blessed. You, you. And so she starts with this lovely term of congratulations. I notice again and again, you know, that when a person becomes a Christian, they stop using the word lucky. Have you noticed that? One of our embarrassments at our wedding was that uh, we just got posed for the photograph and some little child ran up with a great big silver horseshoe on a white ribbon. So we thanked the little child and just passed it quickly back to someone behind. Christians don't believe in luck. Black cats, horseshoes, all the rest of it. Sheer superstition. We believe in blessedness. And that's not arbitrary. That's not chancy. That's in line with God's will and purpose. Oh, how blessed you are. Not how lucky you are, Mary, but how blessed you are. And how blessed is the baby you are going to bear, because Mary wasn't even pregnant yet. How blessed is the baby you're going to bear. And she saw all this by the Holy Spirit, and she saw into the future. And so her first word of what was one of congratulation. Her next word was one of consternation. Oh dear, that you came to see me. Now, once again, the Holy Spirit has reversed the roles. It was the duty of a young girl to go and see an elderly relative. But now Elizabeth is saying, I should have come to see you. There's something all upside down here. It's wrong way around. You are the mother of my Lord. Do you know, in these passages we're studying this morning, we shall get a balanced view of Mary. The Roman Catholics have too high a view. The Protestants have too low a view. The Bible has a balanced view. And some of the titles that the Catholics give to Mary are too high. And some of the titles we don't give to Mary, we should do. And we should call her the Blessed Virgin Mary. This uh, scripture tells us to do just that. Henceforth all generations will call me blessed. So you can talk about the Blessed Virgin Mary. But Mother of God is not a title the Bible gives to Mary. Elizabeth does not say Mother of God. That implies that Mary was there before God, which she wasn't. She wasn't even there before the Son of God. It's the Mother of my Lord. You see, she realizes, this elderly woman, Elizabeth, realizes she's in the presence of the Queen Mother of Israel. For her son will be Elizabeth's king. And the word Lord means precisely that here. And Elizabeth was the first person to call Jesus Lord in history. Do you realize that? It took those disciples three years to get through to saying, My Lord and my God. And later, the earliest creed of the Christian church was three words, Jesus is Lord. But the first person who said it was Elizabeth, My Lord's mother. You're the queen mother. And you've come into my humble home. You've come to see me. Now, remember, a poor girl from a village up north engaged to a village carpenter, and Elizabeth says, Queen Mother. Do you know, she's having the same attitude to Mary as 30 years later John would have to Jesus 
even though John was older than Jesus when Jesus came for baptism, John had the same reaction as his mother had had. Oh, you ought to be baptizing me. I oughtn't to baptize you. Now, do you see how the Holy Spirit was telling Elizabeth 30 years before the right attitude to adopt towards Mary? She was our Lord's mother, and therefore we must respect her as that. We must not give her titles that the Bible doesn't give or speculate about characteristics which she didn't have. But we must go as far as the Bible goes in respect for the Blessed Virgin Mary. We don't pray to her. We don't call her Our Lady. We don't put statues up to her. But we respect her as the mother of my Lord. And that's a deep respect which we need to cultivate. Now the third thing, as Elizabeth talks to Mary like this, she sees an expression of bewilderment in Mary's face. And clearly Mary's face is saying, how did you know? How did you know? How did you know? And so the third thing that Elizabeth talks about is the confirmation she had of this amazing truth that Mary was the Queen Mother of Israel. And the confirmation was a beautiful sign which God gave her, which was so suited to a woman. A man wouldn't understand this sign, but that woman would. She said, when you walked in the door, my son recognized you. My son recognized you. They had been told that John the Baptist would be filled with the Holy Spirit from his birth. I tell you now that the Holy Spirit was moving John before he was born. John the Baptist began his career three months before he was born. For his career was to point to Jesus as the Messiah. And this fetus in the womb of Elizabeth was already pointing. And when Mary came in that kitchen, then the fetus jumped and Elizabeth knew. Fancy being guided, not just a little child shall lead them, but an unborn child led Elizabeth. Isn't the story just too good to be true? If I wasn't a Christian, I couldn't believe it. It's just too incredible. But once you know what God can do and know that nothing is too hard for the Lord, the whole thing just slots into place. And so she told Mary of the moving baby. As Elizabeth told Mary about this sign, this confirmation, Mary's face became wreathed in smiles. She was bursting. She was just so happy. And Elizabeth in the Holy Spirit had the gift of discernment to see why. And so her finally, her final remark was to Mary on this ground, Mary, I can see that you're just thrilled because you've believed that the word of God will come true. Do you know the happiest people this Christmas? Those who believe the word of God will come true. The others will have a temporary and fleeting happiness but the real secret of joy is faith. And now Mary knows it's true. She has believed it ever since the angel Gabriel visited, but now she's, she's had tremendous confirmation. Elizabeth pregnant and her baby inside her womb leaping. And now Mary knows it's true and she's just so thrilled. Are you not thrilled that everything God says will come true? Isn't that what makes Christmas for you? Because among other things, Jesus has said, I will come again. And the thing that makes you excited at Christmas is not all the tinsel and fairy lights, but the fact that Jesus is coming again and we're nearer to his second coming than we are to his first. And that makes us thrilled. How do I know he's coming? I have nothing but his word for it, but my joy is based on my faith. Oh, Mary, you're so happy because you believe that it, what he says will come true. And so Elizabeth's prophecy is over. At this point, Mary speaks. And I just want to tell you this, that one loving heart sets another on fire. One person filled with the Spirit moves others. Praise is infectious. And if just one person will praise God out loud, that will help others to do so also. And when Elizabeth was filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit and prophesied and said, oh, how blessed, then that sparked Mary off and she responded. And now Mary is just full to overflowing and out it comes out of her mouth. And we have what I would call in modern English the magnificent. 
Magnificat comes from the first word of the Latin translation, magnify the Lord. To magnify means to get a bigger view, to enlarge your vision of God, to get bigger ideas of God, because most of us, as that little paperback booklet that came out a few years ago stated in its title, most of us, our God is too small, too small. We have little ideas of God, and so we ask him to do little things, and, and we're petty about it. But God's a great big God. Oh, magnify the Lord. Let's do that by looking into Mary's praise now, the magnificent Magnificat. Let's magnify the Lord through what she says. For 2,000 years this has been sung. I think perhaps it's been sung a bit too often in some circles and not often enough in others. And so it gets routine. But it's a magnificent song of praise. It's steeped in the scripture. Again and again there's an echo of a psalm. And above all there is one passage in the Old Testament that comes out very clearly in the Magnificat. It's the song of Hannah, another woman who didn't expect to have a baby and had one. And you'll find it in 1 Samuel 2, verses 1 to 10. And Hannah's song seems to have sparked this off too and re be related to it. But the same Holy Spirit inspired both. But it's all about God, not about Mary. Mary would be horrified if she knew how many people were praising her. She would say, follow my example in the Magnificat, praise God. It's all about God, it's all about him. She mentions God 15 times in a little short song. At least I've said a song, but she said it first. What a wonderful God he is. Just four things about this God I want to highlight. Number one, his generosity. That's a word translating as grace. I've said already that Catholics have too high a view and Protestants have too low a view of Mary. We've reacted against the abuse on the other side, and so we've gone to another extreme. There's a biblical balance. Let's get the titles right. Number one, God is her Savior. Therefore, we don't need to try and say that Mary had sinless perfection or that it was an immaculate conception of someone who was perfect. We don't need to say these things. God was her Savior. Mary was a sinner saved by grace. And therefore, God was her Savior and she recognized that she needed a Savior. And so that is the first title we need to think of when we think of Mary. She was saved by God through grace. Grace was upon her, which enabled a sinner to be the mother of our Lord. That to me is far more wonderful than saying if she was the mother of Jesus, she had to be sinless. To think that God can use a sinner saved by grace to hold Christ, that's precisely what he does with you and with me. And he plants the spirit of Jesus in our hearts. And we sinners can say, God my Savior. The second title I want you to notice is the title Mary gave herself, Servant. Servant. Incredible what titles have been added. One of the latest that has been added is co-redemptrix. Let's get it right. It means that she shared the work of redemption. No. Do you know what she would say? Servant, servant. We saw it last Sunday night, maid, maid servant. It's literally slave girl. That's the title she gave herself and what a title it is and every true Christian should give himself or herself that title. When Paul writes an epistle, he says, Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. And then calls Jesus the Savior. Now Mary puts herself not at the front of the church to be worshipped, but among the congregation. The Bishop of Mexico, I'm referring now to the Roman Catholic Bishop of Mexico, of course, a few years ago was filled with the Holy Spirit to overflowing. And one of the first things he did was to go into the cathedral in Mexico where there was a statue of Our Lord at one end of the altar and a statue of Our Lady at the other. And he picked up the statue of Our Lady and he took it to the back of the church and turned around facing the front. And when the people arrived and said, what do you do that for? He said, in my Bible, she's in the congregation worshiping Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Now the tourist guides point out the only Protestant Catholic cathedral in, in the world. <laughs> this is where we will unite. If we unite at all, it will be on the truth of God's word. 
not on Baptist tradition or Catholic tradition or any other tradition. It will be on the truth. Mary said, God my Savior, who's remembered his servant. And that puts Mary with us. And that put Mary in the congregation in Acts 1, praying for Pentecost. And that puts Mary into the day of Pentecost as just one of 120 men and women on whom the Holy Spirit fell. And once again, she opened her mouth and praised God. So that you see where Mary is. Savior, servant. And then she said, from henceforth, all generations will call me Mother of God, Queen of Heaven. No, she didn't say that. She said, all will call me blessed. And the one thing about the word blessed is this. It always points to the blesser. Doesn't it? Doesn't it? If you're lucky, that points to luck, having done something in your life. If you're fortunate, that points to fortune, having taken over. But if you say blessed, that points to the God of all blessing. And therefore, when you congratulate someone, say how blessed you are, and that points straight to God. And in fact, Mary would say, look to God. He has done great things in me. In fact, Mary did nothing marvelous. She did nothing other than any other girl who has a baby does. Carrying that baby for nine months and then going through labor to bring that baby to the world, she did just what every other mother does. It was God who did the wonderful part and who caused that conception to take place miraculously. So Mary would say, he's the Savior, I'm his servant. He's done wonderful things for me. So call me blessed. And then you will think of the one who blessed me. Does that help us to get a, a true perspective? Now she moves on from there to praise the integrity of God. One of the greatest mistakes being made today is to begin with God as love. Now some of you may be shocked by my saying this, but I'm going to stand by it. I believe that we're getting a sentimental, soft, distorted view of God. Because people begin thinking about God by thinking about his love. And that's not where godly people begin. It's not where the Bible begins. Genesis 1 doesn't say God is love. You've got to work almost to the end of the Bible before you find the statement God is love. And even in the book in which you find the statement God is love, that's the second statement made about God and not the first. And the first is God is light. And the Bible begins here. Now, I hope you won't misunderstand this either, but because men and women are made differently and men are tougher and women are more tender, makes it more difficult for a mother to discipline children than for the father. The father can easily become over harsh and the mother can easily become over soft. Therefore, there is a temptation for women to concentrate on the love of God and see the tender side rather than the strong side. But Mary is an example to all women where did she begin when she thought of the integrity of God's character? She said, holy is his name. Here's another who starts with the holiness of God. And therefore she goes on to talk about the fear of God. Thank God for mothers who believe in the holiness and the fear of the Lord. That's where she began. And when you begin there, you then see his goodness as mercy. Mercy. And undeserved mercy, because he's so holy that we don't deserve a thing except death and punishment. And when you say holy is his name, when he does something good for you, then it's a mercy, it's undeserved. But if you begin with the love of God, you will regard his goodness as a right that you have. And if you ask people what is God today, just go around the streets and say, what do you think about God? If they think anything at all, they'll tell you, well, God is love. But very, very few will say, holy is his name, and his mercy is on those who fear him. Oh, here's a woman with a balanced view of God. Here's a woman with a strong view of God. Here's a woman, a 15-year-old girl, who knows her Bible well enough to know that holy is his name, and those who fear him receive undeserved mercy. But you see, if you don't stress his holiness, you don't use the word mercy. You just say love. And then, well, he's bound to help us and get us to heaven because he loves us. And there can't be a place called hell because he's love. And we argue like this. And we miss the mercy of God. But a person who starts with holy as his name and fear him will say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I stress this because the integrity of God's holiness 
was something that Mary praised. And she rejoices that his mercy goes on down through the generations. The fourth thing he pr she praises is his equity. Funny word maybe to use. You may never have thought of it in connection with God. Stanley Jones, the Indian missionary who died just a year or so ago, once said this, the Magnificat is the most revolutionary document in the world. And he was referring to the next three verses. The most revolutionary. God upsets all our ideas of human social importance and status. He reverses it all. And here we have a bigger revolution than any communist manifesto ever envisaged. What's the revolution? That God will take those who are proud and powerful and have possessions and knock them to the bottom, even kings off their throne. These are the things that people think are important. These are the things that people think will get them to the top. Room at the top, life at the top. And God will say, if that's what you sought in life, then back to the bottom. And then to those who are humble and those who are poor and the nobodies and the have-nots, God exalts them. That's a revolution, if you like. It goes far further than everything the communists have thought of, as I've said. It goes further than any revolutionary outlook today. God is the greatest revolutionary of all, the great leveler, the great lifter and the great humbler. And so the mighty kings and those who've sought power and those who've become proud and, and pride is the deadliest of all the seven deadly sins. Those who've thought that they were the great I am, God brings down to the bottom. Then he takes the humble and the have-nots, people that you wouldn't notice, and he says, these are my important people. Do you know that's going to happen? There was a competition not long ago in which newspaper journalists were invited to think up the most startling headline they could think. And one was uh, income tax reduced to fourpence in the pound. And another was the one that got the prize, really got everything in, Negro, dope, fiend, slays, preacher's mistress. That had the lot. Color, race, religion, sex, murder, everything. But you know what the second prize was? The meek shall inherit the earth next Wednesday. The meek. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And Jesus said the meek, the nobodies, the humble, simple people, they are going to have the earth, not those who grab it, not those who want to develop property all over it, but those who are just humble before God. Now, where did Mary get this revolutionary idea from? How did she understand? It's so simple. Mary must have asked this question a thousand times since the angel Gabriel spoke to her. Why me? Why me? And our pride is such that when God chooses us, we look for a reason for the fact in us. And the reason is not in us, it's in him. And the reason is this, God chooses people not for what they've got, but for what they haven't got. Can you understand that revolution? What they haven't got. That's why he chose the Jews. They hadn't got a thing. And God loves to choose nobodies and make them somebodies. He loves to choose those who have nothing and then give them everything for that will glorify his name and fulfill his purpose. And Mary had realized this, the Holy Spirit had made it clear to her that God had not chosen Mary because she was special, but because she was ordinary. And because she was just a poor little girl in the village, engaged to the carpenter. Isn't that tremendous? I tell you this, if any one of us in this church this morning had been given the job of arranging Christ's birth, we would never have thought of this. Can you imagine it? Well, we'll have to have the archbishops and the bishops there in the front row, and we'll have to get the red carpet out, and trumpeters, that sounds good. We, you know, we're so good at ceremonies for ourselves. Just imagine what we would have made of the coming of the King of Kings into this world if we'd been given the job of arranging it. But God is a revolutionary, and he just didn't abide by human protocol, and he chose a little girl who was poor and humble. And he said, you, you. So as Paul later wrote to the Christian church at Corinth, he said, look at you. Not many great people among you. 
Not many noble, not many wise, not many rich, not many clever, not many greats. Just nobodies. But it's the nobodies who hold the future of our world in Christ. So finally she finishes this magnificent song of praise by praising God's fidelity. God's fidelity. She's saying to God, you remembered. You remembered. And she's referring to two things. You remembered your promise after 2,000 years. And we can forget a promise after 2,000 minutes. After 2,000 years, you remembered what you said. You remembered that you were promising to send us a deliverer. And you said it to Abraham. You remembered. You remembered. Have you ever had the experience of receiving an unexpected birthday or Christmas card after many years of being out of touch with someone? Or a wedding anniversary card? And you thought, they remembered. They remembered. You remembered, Lord. You were faithful to your promise and to your people. And God is. You may forget God. You may get away from God. But he hasn't forgot you, forgotten you. If he's written your name in his book of life, he will never forget you. He remembers his people. Abraham and his descendants forever. And if you've believed in Jesus, you're a descendant of Abraham. Read Romans 4 if you don't believe me. And so he will remember you forever. Forever. You forget him, you run away from him. He won't forget. When you're sensible enough to come back home, you'll find that he was looking out for you and waiting to run and fall on your neck and kiss you. You remembered. And so the magnificent Magnificat, praising God for his generosity in using a humble servant to be blessed, Praising God for his integrity, the holiness of his name, the fear of his name that produces mercy. Praising God for his fidelity to his promise. Praising God for that revolutionary equity by which he levels everybody up. And we become sinners before him, whatever our position in life. So Mary left Elizabeth. She went home. She stayed actually for three months just to help Elizabeth through the last stages of her pregnancy and then she went. For by this time, Mary was feeling sick in the morning and the conception must have taken place while she was with Elizabeth. And now she has to go back and face her fiancé and face the village and the gossip and she's got to explain and, and she doesn't, you know, she, she just trusts God. Who would understand if she said, while I've been south, the Holy Ghost visited me and I'm going to have a baby? No, she left it to God to do the explaining. She left just before the confinement of Elizabeth, which we'll study tonight, presumably to avoid publicity, to avoid talk among the many relatives. And she journeyed back. And these two women, who as far as we know never met again in life, these two women shared the most amazing secret, and it was this, that within their wombs, the future course of history was being determined. That's the way it's always been, that God comes down and chooses ordinary folk and plants within them that which will fulfill his purposes. We'll continue this wonderful story tonight. Let us pray. Oh God, we're amazed that there are such possibilities in our ordinary lives that you can use ordinary folk like ourselves. It's almost too overwhelming. But Lord, our fear is that there may be those here even this morning who couldn't be used because they don't believe and therefore they don't have the joy. Lord, may, be, may we be willing to be filled to overflowing with your Spirit to do and to be and to say whatever you wish. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.